Hello and welcome to IdeaGens TV's Summit Series. Today we are excited to have with us Bronwyn Batel, the Chief Impact Officer for the Sarasota Manatee DeSoto at United Way Suncoast, Florida. Welcome. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Yes, we are pleased to have you here. We cannot wait to hear some of the insights that you'll be bringing out of your community. So let's start by learning a little bit more about the work that you lead in the Sun Coast region of Florida, aimed at building more resilient, thriving, inclusive communities. Tell us a little bit about the work and initiatives that you're leading. Thank you very much. Um, well, as you know, United Way Suncoast believes that everyone deserves equitable access to opportunities to create the life they imagine. And we call that freedom to rise. We act on that belief by partnering with businesses, nonprofits, media, government, and community. And we focus on early learning, youth success, and financial stability, the three interconnected pillars that create a foundation for thriveability, both individually and for communities as a whole. So United Way Suncoast is a five county United Way covering Hillsboro, Pinellas, Manatee, Sarasota and DeSoto counties. So if you're familiar with the west coast of Florida, every single one of our communities is unique. They have their own rhythm, their own government, school districts and more. However, we know that also in each of our counties, individuals and families are struggling. They're struggling to make ends meet and not all of our children have equitable access to opportunities to reach their full potential and rise. So we appreciate, acknowledge, and respect those differences, seek commonalities where possible, and we plan together with our communities to ensure that we are on the right path and our community feels ownership in all that we do together. Some of our strategies include intense place-focused work, collaborative community initiatives like the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, investments in strategic community partners that lead to shared outcomes and to ensure continuity corporate and individual fundraising and volunteerism. But one particular effort that I think is valuable for today's conversation, and it's near and dear to my heart, it's called the Big Plan, Community United for Our Children's Future. And it came about because in the 1718 school year in 10 schools in the central corridor, right in the middle of the heart of Manatee County, there were 989 children in third grade. At the end of that school year, 742 of them did not test as reading on grade level. That's 75% of our students. So the big plan aims to cut in half the number of children not reading on grade level by the time they leave third grade in 10 schools in Manatee County by 2026. That's why it's the big plan, because it, it is a big plan. Um, and it takes a lot of big partnerships to make it happen. Our strategies are to anchor in places, to work with cohorts of children, not percentages, to create tight in and out of school connections and to remove barriers to access. Our focus is on school readiness, summer learning, attendance, family engagement, and again, that barrier removal. And we don't do it alone. Our advisory council partners are from the Patterson Foundation, Manatee County Government, the School District of Manatee County, Early Learning Coalition of Manatee County and Manatee Community Foundation. And we've also focused our United Way community investments in this area and have many strategic community partners leading with us. I hope that answers that first question. That absolutely does. It's quite the initiative that you are leading up there. Um, I can certainly see why it is called the big plan. Um, and it certainly sounds like you're using a lot of partners, a lot of networks and connections in your community to achieve uh, the incredible goals that you guys have put forth. Um, so I applaud you on that. Um, and so moving on, how exactly do you choose your target population to work with? And, and how do you choose particular issues to address? Hmm. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. We get asked that a lot. Um, I like to focus on people, place, policy, and process. So that systems, uh, excuse me, systems change and barrier removal so that by the time we're finished in a particular area, and you're never really finished, I just want to qualify that is that we've left something behind that our community can continue to follow for years to come. And in the words of Frederick Douglass, so one of my um, favorite quotes is that it is easier to grow strong children than repair broken men. And when you think about when he said those words and where we are as a nation, 
I think that it's clear that everybody ought to be concerned about this. And we chose the particular areas, one, because of how our children were struggling in those areas, but also because they have a high population in our community of what we call ALICE, Asset Limited Income Constrained Yet Employed Families, and Low Mobility. So we wanted to make sure that if we were trying to make a dent, uh, and we will, on our children's grade level reading success, that, that we wanted to make sure that we were going to work in a community that would um, be there for the long haul. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I love what you said. Not only that quote, because I think that that needs to be heard more, but the fact that you're wanting to leave something behind for the community to build off of. If, if that isn't the definition of sustainability right there, then I don't know what is. So absolutely, and I, I, I love the mission you guys have. Um, and it, it certainly sounds like in order to enact these policies, enact these plans, there's a lot of leaders that need to be involved at the community and local level. And so what advice would you have for leaders who have great ideas but might not know how to bring them to fruition or scale? Mm. For first and best advice is to just get started. Have those conversations. Figure out who you need to have at the table um, so that you've got all the voices around you. Um, I do want to clarify, though, is that with us, with community impact, it doesn't always mean that everybody has to buy in from the beginning. So take what you have, learn and go from there. Um, our children deserve it and our community deserves it. So if you're going to be innovative, you're going to need to make sure that you're really feeling focused on what you want to accomplish and that you don't stray to the right or to the left or, or to other directions, depending on the voices that you hear on any given day. You set your strategies and you go for it. I love that. Just just get started. Uh, I think that's probably one of the most difficult steps in that because it's kind of almost like a leap of faith. And I absolutely agree that the community and the children, they 100% they deserve it. Um, you know, as that quote, as you said, it, it's easier to build those children up than, you know, rework and shape men. So I absolutely love that. And, and it sounds like you guys are kind of paving a way. You have these, these quite lofty goals and uh, absolutely achievable, but how has innovation played a role in the development and the rollout of these programs and the work that you do? Thank you. That was one of the most important parts of the work that we do because at the time we were not focused in our efforts in that way. We had a bigger plan, which is wonderful. And the idea is of course, getting our children, all of our children, and we still have that, that overarching goal of getting all of our children reading on grade level by the time they leave third grade, which is that critical milestone from the time that a child goes from learning to read to reading to learn. So if they're not reading to learn by the time they enter fourth grade, they begin the process of thinking about when they might be able to drop out. They may not be able to define it that way, but it's what's occurring because they're looking around and realizing that they can't keep up with their peers. So we wanna make sure that we, we close that achievement gap and we get children reading um, where they need to be. And the only way to do that is through innovation. So thinking outside of the way things have been so United Ways have um, for many years been gathering resources and investing in partners. And we had already narrowed that process to which partners are focused on early learning. But then when we targeted a particular area within our community, for instance, those 10 schools and the, the attendance zones surrounding, that became a different story. And that meant that we needed different partners at the table and we needed leadership at the table at all levels. So, so for us, the innovation came in the partnering and the strategy for long-term, but also we set an audacious, audacious and ambitious goal of cutting that number in half by 2026. That's not an easy thing to do, but we do believe that it's achievable. And by doing that, we believe that's where the innovation happens as well. I love that you, that you set that goal for a certain date and time, 2026. You know, we, we discuss a lot about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and how they're to be achieved by 2030. And I think if organizations and leaders like yourself continue to set these goals, uh, you know, that however ambitious and however, you know, it might seem difficult to achieve, as you say, just get started, um, then we can really achieve those United Nations goals. I mean, so far I've heard you touch on multiple of them, quality education, sustainable communities, um, and uh, partnerships for the goals. And so it's incredible to see how that's enacting in these communities. 
and going forward. I also like what you said, uh, you know, going from learning to read to reading to learn. Uh, as someone who's now been out of uh, college for about a year or so, I know that you never stop learning. And so it's essential to have those, those uh, you know, qualities and, and capabilities in place to be able to continue to learn even after the fact when you have to teach yourself. So I love the points that you're making here. And, and you know, we've talked about some of these goals that you're hoping to achieve by, by 2026. And um, I, I can't help but ask, you know, what has been one of the greatest challenges that you've learned or had along this way that you're facing? Uh, one of the greatest challenges was in the beginning, and it's, it's less so now. Well, actually, I'll have to add two, because COVID was a surprise challenge that we did not that challenges are, are always anticipated, but COVID was definitely um, not on our radar at the time. Um, however, before that, it really is about gathering the right partners at the table and the pace at which you can move forward as trust is being built. So if you don't have that trust, you know that you need to take the time, but everything in you is saying, let's move faster um, and let's make this happen right now. So taking the time to build the trust is a challenge, but it's also an incredible opportunity because I can tell you that once that trust is built, it accelerates everything else. Um, COVID also was a challenge, but I also see that as a way of af uh, affirming the path that we were on. Because when COVID hit, we, when we started to have to, you know, children were learning at home and the community was talking about, you know, what resources do we need? Where do we need to focus? We knew where. We knew which children, we knew which families, we knew which neighborhoods were going to struggle the most. And that, that was gratifying. Um, it was concerning. There, there are just a lot of emotions that are wrapped up into feeling as though we were on a path so that our community didn't become unmoored by COVID-19. And we did see, we we're thrilled to, to be able to share that we did see progress in grade level reading. We also saw some changes in the data and that was um, not satisfying for us, but it was satisfying to see that we saw less um, less falling backward and more moving forward than we had anticipated. I, I think it's incredible that when, you know, you were faced with challenges, uh, you know, innovation came into play, but that you still saw the progress. Um, and I really like what you heard uh, said that uh, having the right partners at the table, I think that we're hearing more and more that to be able to accomplish, you know, these huge sustainable uh, goals that it needs to be uh, not just one person or one organization, but a group of individuals with a combined effort, combined mindset, combined purpose to achieve those things. And so we've heard a lot of what you have accomplished and what you're hoping to accomplish. And so what has been one of your greatest points of pride so far along this journey? We have several points of pride, um, and one of them that I go back to is from the very beginning, uh, we were working with our Early Learning Coalition and hoping that we could get a unique identifier number. I don't want to take credit for that because our Early Learning Coalition was working on that um, more so than the partnership itself, but that came into fruition last year. And that's an exciting thing because when you talk about being able to leave something behind, now we know the story of our children, at least from the time they're three years old, and we're working on that number being apl applicable to the time from birth on. And before it was like a no man's land of information. We knew our children were some places, but we also knew that many of them were showing up without having had any quality um, early learning before arriving to school. And that does not necessarily set you on a path for success. So having that unique identifier number, it speaks to the barriers, people, place, policy, and practice. So we've got the policy and the practice in place, which is just really incredible for us. We've also had some incredible policy wins in the state of Florida around early education and quality. And um, those two are really great points of pride. Absolutely, I would completely agree. And I, again, I applaud you for those efforts because that, that, that is incredible. Um, so now we, we've talked about you know, the past, the challenges and the pride that you've seen. Now, looking forward and forecasting, uh, you're, you're about five years away from the goal that you're hoping to achieve. Um, and so looking out you know, five to 10 years, what impact do you want your work to have on the Tampa Bay, Suncoast region of Florida? <laughs> Thanks for asking that question. I'm always five years out. So I already kind of believe 
that we are in that space of all of our children having a strong start, equity and access to early education, education pathways in our community will have an infrastructure. That's really key. It will have an infrastructure for success in literacy. Um, something that we have moved a little bit away from that philosophic base of our children being our most important investment for thriveability. Um, we will have strengthened and made a lasting impact with the four P's, people, place, policy, and practice. And that foundation that leads to community and individual thriveability. And everybody should care about that and have that in their vision and worldview of where we are five years from now, hopefully before then. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, the, that's that's a great goal and great forecasting there because, you know, now is important, but so is what comes next, the next step. Um, so I, I, I completely agree with that. And so as we begin to wrap things up here, what are your what are your final words of advice for our viewers and our listeners across the planet? Um, you know, what have you learned in the work that others should know as well? Okay. Um, I really, I don't know, but I'll share this out loud, is that I have been a CrossFitter for the past six years. Um, I enjoy that, that form of working out. And my very first CrossFit coach had a slogan that he would put on the door, and it was, um, leave your ego at the door and your sweat on the floor. <laughs> so for me, that that's it. I think about that now for all of the things that I do in life is your ego really has to be set aside. I can't stress that enough. That's the first piece of, of advice I would give to anybody. I also want to underscore the idea that collaboration does not mean that we have to have everyone at the table from the beginning. Start with that coalition of the willing. Create space. Be intentional in your focus and your messaging. Welcome a variety of perspectives and lead with data and then continuously evaluate. And at the end, keep going. So just don't give up. Absolutely. Leave your ego at the door and the sweat on the floor. I like that. I'm taking a lot away from this today. A lot of different quotes <laughs> and things that you brought forth with us. Well, Bronwyn Baitall, the Chief Impact Officer for Sarasota, Manatee, DeSoto, United Way, Suncoast, Florida. Thank you so much for sitting down with us, and, and thank you for the work that you're continuing to do. It's absolutely vital, and I, I think that now we've seen in COVID times and past how vital it is and how it's going to continue to be so. And so I will be rooting for you to achieve your goals by 2026, thank you. and it's with organizations and leaders like yourself that we will ultimately achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed being here. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Absolutely. Thank you.